if you want to have impact, you need to be using stories. If you just, uh, we, we differentiate between different choices we make when we communicate and the standard business choice is assertion. Now, let me tell you what you should think. Let me tell you what I think and you should adopt what I think. Um, and, and we call it a push strategy and it doesn't work. Well, no, I'll take that back. It has limited e efficacy because if you, we, it's a push strategy. I'm going to push my message at you and the person, the human being who is on the receiving end basically resists. So story is the, the opposite end of the communication uh, spectrum. It's a different choice. Welcome to the Marketing Your Practice podcast, where we guide natural health and wellness experts through the pitfalls of marketing. Each episode, you'll learn simple, effective, easily actionable, and heart-centered marketing strategies. And here's your host, Angus Pike. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, friends. Today, we're going to be talking all about the power of story and why you should be sharing more stories in your marketing in your communication and in your patient education. Our guest today is storytelling and story listening expert, Mark Schenk. Now, Mark and his team at Anecdote help businesses just like us tell better stories. Mark is passionate about using stories to help leaders be more engaging, more inspiring and more influential in their organizations and to help make their strategies stick. Now, Mark is also a regular golfer, an inspiring underwater photographer, and dreams one day of catching the iconic Murray Cod in Canberra's Lake Burley Griffith. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks, Angus. It's great to be here. I, um, we have a mutual friend uh, in Lisa Smiths. Lisa has been talking to me about you for some time now, and um, I've been wanting to catch up. I'm very excited for us to chat today about stories and how we can better implement those into all levels of our communication. Can you give our audience um, perhaps a bit of your background story about what led to you falling in love with stories, so to speak? Well, um, so I spent 20 years in the Air Force and it's, a lot of people kind of go, really? You know, in the Air Force, where I was a logistics officer. So, yes. you know, like kind of running airfields and doing very practical things. And people go, wow, you know, you go from something really practical and, and uh, you know, like where, where results are everything to this very esoteric field of storytelling. And I, I, I basically I assure them that story is not some esoteric thing. It's an incredibly important communication tool and undervalued. And, and I had no idea about the value of stories um, in any kind of conscious way until after I left the Air Force. And on my first, my first day at work after, after leaving the Air Force after 20 years, um, I was, I was, I can tell you the date, it's 5th of July, 1998. It was a, yeah, a Monday. And I turned up to work in a consulting company. And on that very first day, I met the guy that is now my business partner, Sean Callahan. And uh, we found uh, we were very mutual interest in things like collaboration and knowledge management and, and how do humans work together. Now, uh, Sean is a bit of a maven in the, uh, in the Gladwellian sense, right? He's always out exploring and he kind of went, ah, oh, we need to understand complexity. And so uh, he started sharing articles around complexity. We got very deep into complexity science and complex adaptive systems. And that's where we ran into story for the first time. Story is this incredibly powerful tool that helps humans make sense of the world, helps us communicate. We've been doing it for time immemorial. And Sean and I were, were sitting down having a, a beer one night after watching a guy give a, a, an amazing presentation. And we were just looking at each other going, why doesn't everybody communicate like that? And that's when we kind of went, well, you know what? We need to do something about it. So we formed our company in 2004. And uh, yeah, look, uh, for, for a long time, we held our, uh, we, we, we hid our mission or our, sorry, our purpose under a bushel. Um, yeah, we were kind of, oh, it's a bit soft and fluffy. Our, our purpose is to help restore humanity to the workplace. Mm. And story is our vehicle. Uh, and so, yeah, we've been doing this for a long time. Um, neither of us are actors or dramatists or authors or film producers or anything theatrical where business people who go, there's a powerful tool out there. People who are in their, their working lives need to know how to use this tool. So that's, that's kind of how I got into it. Mm, I, I've been mesmerized. Well, I'm sure by stories since I was a child, I've had the pleasure of kind of speaking on stages around the world and watching other people present 
and started to realize that those presenters, you know, that shared stories, just how incredibly captivating it was, um, even when talking about a topic that I wasn't necessarily interested in, it wasn't an area of my expertise, but when somebody could tell a great story, one, how much it stuck with me. Um, you know, I can remember back decades ago of great stories that were told. And then I started to kind of dive into this world of how to tell a great story. And it's frustrating because it's difficult to learn how to tell a story. And many times I would be telling myself, well, look, I would tell stories if I had great stories to tell. You know, when somebody has had near-death experiences, has been hijacked, um, grew up in a terrible kind of neighbourhood and was robbed at, uh, at knife point multiple times. It seems like they're great stories. Um, but I started to realise in many cases, many of the great stories were the things that happened to us every day as well. So let's talk about... So we've got practitioners, this thing, chiropractors and naturopaths, and many of us um, are very analytical and data-driven and stuff like that. Why should we be telling more stories to our patients and in our communications? Well, it, if you want to have impact, you need to be using stories. If you just, uh, we, we differentiate between different choices we make when we communicate and the standard business choice is assertion. Now, let me tell you what you should think. Let me tell you what I think and you should adopt what I think. Um, and, and we call it a push strategy and it doesn't work. Well, no, I'll take that back. It has limited ep efficacy because if you, we, it's a push strategy. I'm going to push my message at you. And the person, the human being who is on the receiving end basically resists. So story is the, the opposite end of the communication uh, spectrum. It's a different choice. And that's where you describe something that people can picture happening and they pull it towards themselves. And it's, so if, if you want to have influence, if you want people to be engaged, if you want people to be inspired, if you want to have impact, then story is your tool. And can I just give you an example of what you just said? Mm -hmm. I, I too speak around the world and I, I watch people speak and most of, most of them are terrible. So, um, but um, in April last year, uh, I went to the Melbourne Exhibition Centre and I saw Pat Lencioni uh, speak. Uh, he's the author of The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, 10 other books. You know, he's a right. He's basic underachiever. Um, <laughs> and uh, he's... He spoke from 9am to midday with a half hour break. And uh, at, at lunchtime, when he finished, um, uh, Sean and I were sitting together. We occasionally, very occasionally, it's one of those rare occasions where we were together. Such great learning experiences when we're together. Anyway, we go out into the auditorium. We're just talking to people, circulating. Everyone is raving about how good he is. Raving. He's so intelligent. He's so engaging. He's such a great communicator. Yeah, and like... Just such a, you know, so we're asking, do you know what he did? What was it that made him? And they're going, oh, no idea, no idea. And finally we met this lady, uh, Jackie, Jackie Williamson. And um, I've known her for a while. And she said, oh, I totally know what he did, Mark. Every time he wanted to make a point, he would introduce it. He would give an example and then I'd pack the theory. He just did it the whole time. Didn't use the, well, um, he almost never used the word story, but he had a story for everything. Um, so. The, the great speakers, they know the power of this. Just watch, you know, the, the jobs, uh, Simon Sinek, you know, people who are the ones who are commanding the, the, the world stage. They tell stories. It's just mm. what they do. Sorry, just the, and, and one more thing. The interesting thing is that most of the time you don't even know. Effective storytelling is invisible. And so I've noticed a couple of times you've already said, oh, well, I, uh, you know, I want to tell you a story. Never say that. Right. So you just say, you know, I've got an example that just illustrates that point really clearly. Yes. Yeah. Great. Great, great. How do we begin? I think one of the things that's interesting, I think the hierarchy that we're stuck in, certainly as health practitioners, and, and I know that, you know, whilst we're not certainly under the same umbrella that perhaps a traditional medical practitioner is, once upon a time, you know, health practitioners just told their patients what to do. And I think with the, uh, the growing access of information. Nowadays, what most people in our communities are looking for is a partner. You know, they're not looking for somebody to tell them what to do. They're, you know, I have patients coming to me now with armed with many cases knowing more about the diagnosis than I do. I have to actually kind of bone up to kind of get up to speed with regards to them. And I think even less nowadays, 
does somebody want somebody to tell them what to do? That push strategy that you talked about beforehand, you know, they're wanting a partnership as, as well. So where do we begin this? When you're working with a company who wants to start to implement stories more into their communication, where do you start? Uh, it depends, but one of the common ways of starting is just equipping uh, senior executives with the understanding and some skills that they can start doing it themselves and leading by example. Now, interestingly, in fact, it's, it, it's interesting, but it's not surprising when you think about it. Cognitively, none of this stuff is difficult. And that's, but behaviorally, it's so difficult because we're so conditioned to default to this assertion style. It's just what we do. And I mean, I can demonstrate this all the time, just, just to ask somebody, ah, so explain what you do for a living. Oh, well, you know, I'm a, you know, I do a blah, 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 I'm a holistic practitioner and I do the blah, blah, blah and the blah, blah, blah. And it's really uh, uh, unengaging. Mark, could you give me an example perhaps of somebody that you have worked with who's changed their, you know, what do you do from, you know, I'm a, an electrical engineer through to probably telling a story? Well, in fact, one of the, it's, a, it's an interesting one of uh, one of the the best storytellers that I know is an aeronautical engineer, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he well, we learned to scuba dive together back in 1986. I remember standing on the beach at Hyams Beach in New South Wales, about to enter the water for the first time. Um, anyway, Luke's an aer aeronautical engineer, and uh, so he's kind of we're, we're friends, and and he, he's watched me on this journey and asked lots of questions and so he now he's now a you know, very senior executive in the government and and he now speaks around the world um, and he he went from transmission of a message to using this different um, packaging device which is called story and so he's now very accomplished at taking a message that he wants and 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 putting it in a different container Right, a container that has events, emotion, context, uh, and the, yeah, he's he's now in, oh, he's totally engaging when he speaks. People go, "Wow, you're an engineer, and you, I understand you." Mm. And it's one of the common things people think. Oh, yes, yeah, so I'm very. I, I live in you know like in a very complex world, and I need to just tell people the facts. That's simply not the case. Mm. One of the frustrations um, that certainly I have, and I know many chiropractors have, is if I'm at a party and I meet you, Mark, and you happen to ask me, what do I do? And I tell you I'm a chiropractor. For many people in the community, when they think of a chiropractor, they think of us as only somebody who might help with back and neck pain. Or I, you know, I crack backs, those kind of things. And for many of our mm -hmm. listeners, they have a scope that's much wider than that. If I wanted to have somebody understand that what I did was beyond just kind of cracking backs and necks as well, how would we, I'm imagining a story might be a good way of doing that as opposed yeah. to saying, well, no, actually the brain controls this and going into the anatomy of it. Could we kind of workshop how our listeners might be able to uh, craft a story that might help them um, uh, tell a different story about what they do? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but I'd, I'd like to, can I, I'd, I'd just like to give you an example from, from my perspective of, yes. of like, so I'm not a, a, a chiropractor or a you know, holistic medical practitioner of any, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm yes. just some random guy. Right. But I have been, uh, Back in about 2000, I was uh, uh, redoing the front yard of my house in Canberra. I was living in Canberra at the time uh, and uh, digging out an old birch tree that had died and uh, had a, a mattock and I was driving a mattock into the ground and there was a buried uh, star picket and oh. I was, you know, the, I was, you know, well, the, the mattock uh, uh, impact spot was well below my feet. Anyway. You can imagine I've hit the, mm. the, the thing, put my back out. And I started going to a guy called Murray Fisher in Canberra. And uh, I saw him regularly. You know, like he, he fixed the immediate problem, but I regularly went back and saw him. And, and we talked about it as being like a tune-up for my, for, my, for, my, uh, um, for my spine. And I really, I always thought of it like that. When I moved from Canberra to Melbourne, um, I was really annoyed, no, not worried. Where am I ever going to find another chiropractor? Right. 
like Murray. Anyway, I, I met, I was so lucky. My, my fiance at the time lived next door to Lisa's practice. Huh? And like, and I'm thinking, no, nah, this is not going to work. Anyway, um, I went and saw Lisa. I was really impressed at how she, she wasn't just interested in my back. She was interested in me. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, sometime, you know, a few, maybe uh, uh, six or eight months later, I had a couple of medical issues and, and, Le- and, and, uh, and I was seeing uh, infectious diseases experts, neurologists, da 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 and all they want to do is the infectious disease guy wanted to talk about, you know, the fact that I'd had typhus and uh, Ross River fever at the same time. And the neurologist was just interested and none of neither of them talked together. But Lisa, she looked at from a big picture perspective and she was the only one who was able to help me. And, uh, and, and I'd made some lifestyle changes and she supported me through that, connected me with different people. It's a, a holistic approach, right? Which I really appreciate. So, that's an example that I would use to describe what you do. Mm. What would you What would you describe? How would you describe what you do in a in a in an example format, in a story format? Yes, I think inside of that too. One of the things that when I get that response from somebody, the first thing step that I do is, and I never used to do this. First thing I do is acknowledge what they say about me. Because if somebody says, oh, you go back crackers and, or something like that too, um, there's a part of me that's quite offended by that too. And I would go, no, that's not what we are at all. But I know that starting a relationship up by making the person I'm communicating wrong is not um, one of the number one strategies of how to win friends <laughs> it, it's, and it's influence. A, yeah. Yeah. So I acknowledge that. And, and generally my bridging statement is a yes and. Um, so yeah, absolutely. We do that and lots more. And then I will in many cases, tell a story as, as well. So sometimes I would pick something wacky and go, yeah, yeah, we also see lots of, of kids. Like, um, for instance, this morning, if it was appropriate, you know, three of the patients I saw this morning were under the age of three and two of them came in to uh, me because they had ear infections. Do you know why a chiropractor sees somebody with ear infections? And then I will start a conversation like that that can be very, very different and that often ends up in a different kind of pathway. And depending on what pops into my mind of who I've seen this week, um, I will tell a story about, about them. Okay. That's worked much better for me than in the early days, I would give them an anatomy and a physiology lesson, Mark, um, that invariably led to their eyes closing over and them needing to go and get another drink to get away from me. So, <laughs> Yes, um, um, thanks, Angus. I'm just going to go and get a, yeah, refresh my glass. Um, so what you've done there is uh, it says that we, we call it an influence pattern, an influence story. And uh, so you meet somebody for the first time and, and you know that many people hold views about, for example, chiropractors, just backcrackers. Mm. And, and so what you've done, what, you, what your strategy is, is uh, the first and second step of the influence pattern, which is you never, ever say that you're wrong. You just acknowledge. Mm. So you go, yeah, look, I'm a chiropractor. And you know what? A lot of people think we're just backcrackers, right? So you just get it out there mm. and you acknowledge it. And, and they're going, yeah, that's what I think. Right? It's, it's in their head. And yes. then you go, but just this morning I did the da da da. So step one, acknowledge yes. what they might be thinking. Even, I mean, if they say it out loud, you just go, ha, ah, you know what? Most people I, I talk to have that same view and I totally understand it. But just, the, and then you go into the story, but you never say it's a story. Yes. And, yeah. and the, the whole reason for that is that we're negatively coded to the word story. Really? Because what's the quintessential start to a story? Uh, once upon a time. Okay. So once upon a time, uh, is that going to be true or false? Yeah. It's a yeah sorry, fictional. Tale. Yes. Yeah, it's fairy tales. It's made up. It's fiction. So we're raised on a diet that associates the word story with fiction. Yes. And that's why you hear people say things like, I want to tell you a story. It's a true story. Right. Because stories aren't true, but this one is. Yes. Right. right. And we don't even, uh, you know, it's worth just being aware that that's the case. Yes. So you just say, so you go, look, I, I, I understand you think, yeah, sorry responding to the scenario where it, that you're introducing yourself, you're meeting somebody at a cocktail party or whatever, and they go, what do you do for a living? You know, I'm a chiropractor. And you know what? Most people think that we're just backpackers. 
And then you don't say, but let me tell you a story. You just go three weeks ago mm. or this morning. So you just go straight into what we call a time marker. Yes. I've, I've noticed in our conversation so far is that often your time markers are very specific. Tuesday morning, 9 a.m. on the 15th of June. Um, there have been a couple of times that I've noticed just how specific you've been with your time markers. Is that part of the strategy that's helpful yes. for it? Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. One, one of the things about time and place is that they are valuable pieces of context for a human being yes. because we know them, right? So as soon as you start with a time and place marker, uh, well, you don't have to have both, but you need to have one or the other. And time marker is most useful. P people know when 2001 was, even if they're not alive then. People yes. know when 1944 is, uh, you know, like, and so you've just given them a piece of context. You're making it easy for them to understand you. Yes. It's, this is, it's so ridiculously simple and so powerful. Most of the time we don't even do it. Yes. Right. And so that could be, you know, we've had our conversation. You've given your rhetorical of, oh, I back crack and I go, yeah, lots of people think um, that as well. My 9 a.m. patient this morning though was actually a, three-year-old girl who yep. came in right so that would be a strategy that we could go through it to get really specific yep. um, with regards to time and place yep uh, so so being specific is a hallmark of stories yes right because you think about stories as being events yes they're events that are connected in a causal sequence and so at nine o'clock this morning uh, um, I had my first patient of the day mm. She was three years old and she came to see me da, 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 you know, because she had an earache. Yes. And so I, da, 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 I treated her and her earache, you know, her, her earache uh, went away. Yes. And, and then, so that's kind of your story. And then you go, and you know what? Let me tell you why people come to, why people, uh, come to see chiropractors for, to treat yes. earache. And then you do the sciencey stuff. Yes. And then you go, and so look, a lot of people, and sorry, and the final bit of the influence story, right? So you start, acknowledge the anti-story, you give the example, if you've got any data, go with that. Yes. But then your final, your, the final landing point is, so a lot of people think we're backcrackers, but man, we're way, way more than that. Yeah, got it. Got it. And the whole package takes three to four minutes, a, a maximum. Yes. So a yeah. A lot shorter. So in that, with regards to the kind of bridging statements of let me tell you a story, what other mistakes are people making when they're trying to add more storage to their communication? Uh, so the, 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 the first and most important mistake is that they don't actually tell a story. Yes. That's the number one thing that people, uh, you know, like let me tell you a story. Uh, it's very important that we understand that uh, chiropractors do data. Right. It's not a story, right? You, you... And it doesn't matter how many times you call. In fact, I'll give you an example. I was in a meeting. Uh, uh, well, I, was, I, was at, uh, I was at the MCG uh, with an organization uh, based there. And uh, I, was, I was meeting with somebody there and having a conversation about how they needed a story to explain the charity that they'd set up and what they were trying to achieve. And having this conversation and then after about 30 minutes of this conversation the head of communications came and sat with us and, and she says I, I tried to give her a quick summary and she said yeah 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 we've already got our story and she pulled out a slide deck and she said here's our story and uh, and and you know like she's she, this slide deck and she's showing me side up to side up to slide and she goes and so that's our story and this is a really good story and I think I said to her do you know what no matter how many times you point to that slide deck and call it a story no matter how strongly you believe that it's a story, it's not a story, right? You can't just point at something and call it a story. So please, you know, for anyone out there, number one, understand what a story is. Yeah. So and what, so a, then what, what, what makes something a story? Uh, so we've got a, 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 there's a simple framework. We call it the spotting stories framework. That's a, you know, quite a simple, it's the key to unlocking the power of story. It, and we can put a link to that uh, yes. so that people can get it um, yep. in, your, in your show notes. Yes. But um, time and place. So first yep. thing, stories, time and place. Second thing is stories are events that happen in a causal sequence. And these are not generalizations, they're not abstractions, they are specific events. 
At nine o'clock, a three-year-old girl came into my office. Yes. Right? It's an event. Um, and, and we often overthink this stuff. Right? Anyway, so really keep it simple. The third thing is they have characters. In your yep. case, it's the three-year-old girl. Yep. Who had an ear, ear infection. And, and maybe the parents who are really worried. Right? Humans are interested in what happens to other humans. So stories have characters. And the final thing is something interesting happens. And so in your story, there's something interesting happening is, you know, and she walked out of there, no earache. Um, so uh, that's, that's a, a very simple time and place, specific events, characters, and something interesting happens. That's, mm. that's it. How, how interesting does the something interesting have to be? Not at all. Not, it, it, it has to be like a, a stories can't be, a, it's not a story if it's just a flat line. Yes. Like, blah, 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 blah. You know, there's peaks and troughs and there's, you know, um, but uh, the, even the tiniest thing. So, you know, I'll give you an example. I walked, so this is, this is a real life story that we collected. Um, somebody saying, I asked, tell me about something that's really made you feel positive at work uh, in the last 12 months. And here's, here was the, a response. Well, I walked down to Gary's office this morning and he's a senior manager and man, I didn't have an appointment. I knocked on his door and he came to the table in the center of the room and gave me his complete attention. Only took 10 minutes and we resolved this, uh, the issues I had. Man, you know, most other managers here, they'll just continue to type and you know, won't even pay attention. Right. And so that is a story that's got this tiny little interesting thing, which is the reveal that most other managers don't do this thing. Yes. So it doesn't have to be a big thing. It just has to be something unexpected, something unanticipated, something we're interested in, um, some, some surprise, not major. It doesn't have to be. Ma we, often, we often think it has to be amazing things. The most valuable stories that your listeners will have will be the everyday things where, you know, like, and if you just, I just encourage people to think, what, what, what happened today that made you feel good? Mm. Oh, well, you know, I, I tell you what, the smile on that, the smile on the three-year-old's face as she walked out. Yeah. Right? I'm, I'm guessing that context is um, what's important with regards to the story there too. Because obviously, the, you know, the three-year-old with the ear infections, there, that story makes great sense in that context and could go under some different kind of umbrellas as, as well. One of the things that, and I don't know if there's a better way to go about this, but one of the things, Mark, I'm doing at the moment is I'm thinking about <clears throat> lessons inside of, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, inside of marketing that I'm wanting to share about commitment and consistency and being valuable and going first. And in the past, what I would have done is just talked about the importance of commitment, that you need to be showing up all the time and all those kind of things there too. And in my recent story journey, what I have done is I went, mm, where in my life has there been an example of commitment um, that has shown that? And then what I have done is I've told the story. I've, the interesting point has been commitment. And then from that, I have bridged that into being valuable uh, um, uh, characteristic for your marketing. Is there, and sometimes, um, so first of all, it, it, for our listeners, is that a, a way they should go about building stories into their communications? Yeah. So, and that, that, that the process you just described is exactly what you do. What, what's, a, what's something, that I, a point that I want to make? Hey, I'm going to make a point about commitment. What you then do is you go and look for an example that illustrates commitment. And so rather than tell people that commitment is important, you have an example that shows people commitment is important. It can be your own experience. It can be someone else's experience. You know, like I was talking this morning with a friend and uh, da, 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 right? So their experience, or it can be, and in fact, you, you, you use this, how you listen to Tim Ferriss's podcast. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. In your most recent episode, you talked about how in one of uh, Tim's earliest podcast episodes, he talked about how he rode a bike. Yes. You know, he wanted to get fit, so he rode the bike. Um, and so uh, the, the, you wanted to make a point about the importance of slowing down and appreciating what was going on. Yes. 
you found that story and you used it to illustrate that point. Right? That's the process. Mm. So figure out the point you want to make and then find an example. And then we talk about there's three buckets, three places you can look for these stories. Your own experience, the experience of others, and the rest of the world. You know, and we use research papers and 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 uh, you know lessons from history and da 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 da. In fact, here's here's one. One of the things that I'd like I'd love to a point that I'm trying to get across to people is that um, I guess I'm a little uh, disappointed at the amount of uh, of uh, shaming and aggression that's going on in relation to COVID nineteen. And I'd just love people to be a little bit more compassionate and, and to take a long term view and a little bit more understanding. And, uh, and so an example I might use from history is uh, in 1976 at the height of the Cold War, sorry, 1986 at the height of the Cold War, Reagan and Gorbachev met in, in Reykjavik um, and the, as, as the very earliest part of the strategic arms limitation talks, reducing number of nuclear weapons. And um, Gorbachev was very much in favour of this. Reagan was Star Wars, Strategic Defence Initiative. I'm gonna, I don't have to worry about your, you know, your, your nuclear weapons because we can pop them out of the sky where they are. And uh, they weren't making much progress and they went for a walk and just Reagan and Gorbachev and the interpreters. And uh, Reagan said, look, Reagan asked a question, what would happen if aliens came from out of space, out of space, and started attacking America, would Russia come to our aid? And Gorbachev went, "Yeah, of course we would." And Gorbachev then, "What about if aliens came and attacked Russia? Would America come to Russia's aid?" And Reagan went, "Yeah, yeah, we would." And so they realised that they do have common interests and taking a long-term view enabled them to start making progress on this very important thing. And so I, I just want people to start taking a long-term view about how we work together as communities and as individuals. And, and rather than focusing on our differences, start focusing on our similarities and our shared beliefs and the things that are important to us. Mm, yeah, I love it. I love it. Before we started recording here, we were talking about, um, the example that one of the challenges that we have as practitioners sometimes is getting people to follow through long enough to get the results. Um, and that uh, many times uh, taking a pill or a lotion or potion gives instantaneous results, but sometimes it takes a series of adjustments over time, or if you're working with a naturopath and they're working with your diet, then we don't lose weight tomorrow, we don't detox tomorrow. And so getting people to kind of follow through and I figure that's probably a great area there to tell stories um, as opposed to kind of, again, so many of us, myself, I'm the worst at it, default back to the anatomy and the physiology of why healing takes time. Um, but that would be an area there where we could use a story instead, yes? Yeah, yeah. And so story is great because most of our decision making is based on emotion rather than logic. And uh, there's a guy called Donald Kahn who wrote uh, a book called Within Reason. He's a Canadian neurologist. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and he wrote, uh, the difference between logic and reason is that logic leads to conclusions and emotion leads to action. And because stories are vehicles for, for conveying emotion, they're very good at getting people to change behavior. So if somebody is, you know, Can like you if you're again. Mark, I, guess I think I, I want to kind of double point on that again there too. It's the difference between emotion and logic. The, the difference between uh, 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 logic and reason, reason and about, emotion yes. right, is, that, is that logic leads to conclusions. Yes. Emotion leads to action. Yeah. And so if you want somebody to change their behavior or change their position or whatever, then emotion is a very powerful tool. And so... Um, if you've got somebody who you who, who they're kind of going, ah, oh, this is taking too long. I'm not making any progress. Um, you can say, look, for, you know, you've got to stick it out. You've got to be committed to the pathway, and uh, um, you know, like these, you know, the neurological things. You, you know, like you can go off into logic and reason, mm -hmm. and or you can do exactly as we talked about in the, when we were having a little chat. You go, look, I, I totally understand that this is taking a long time, and you're not you're not feeling like you're making much progress. So that's where you acknowledge what we call the anti-story, the mm -hmm. thing that's in their head that's a barrier. Right? 
because mm. you want them to stick the course, but they're going, oh, it's not worth it. I'm going to give up. Right. So you acknowledge the anti story and you just say, look, it's okay that you think that mm. because it really is okay that they think that. And then you go, I had somebody in a very similar position six months ago. And you just give the example of somebody else who was doing that. And then they stuck the course and they, they reached that tipping point again in a Gladwellian sense. You know, mm. they reached it. And they, 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 I remember them coming into my office and they sat down and they just said, look, I just really want to thank you for encouraging me to stay the course because I was on the verge of giving up and uh, I would have never made this progress if I'd have given up. Mm. Yeah, I love it. Many of our listeners, Mark, will be able, because I would imagine a testimonial and having a patient share a testimonial um, is a form of a story. Would I be right in that assertion? Um, look, some testimonials are stories. Uh, yeah. Some testimonials are just assertions. Uh, I went and saw Angus and, uh, and he uh, delivered a holistic experience that enabled me to uh, recover sufficiently that I was able to resume work. And it's kind of a story. Yes. Uh, but uh, you want them to be much more, you want them to be uh, as specific as you can. Yes. Um, and particularly talk about how they were feeling. Yes. So we, we think of testimonials as being like we, a success story. Yes. And where somebody has a problem and they feel something, frustration, pain, disappointment, da, da, da. And then they meet a guide, right? You. Yes. And da, da, da. And so now I feel like this. So, so if you just get them to go on that little, rather than, uh, you know, like uh, Angus uh, provided him with first class care and I really appreciate how uh, he, uh, he looked after me and I, da, da, right? You go, look, I came in here and, sorry, a story version is uh, I saw Angus uh, for the first time in uh, uh, mid-2019. Yes. Um, and uh, at the time, I was suffering from da-da. I was feeling really... Mm. And, and I really... A friend told me to go and see Angus. And I, I went because my friend recommended it. But really, I, I, had, I, I didn't expect anything from it. Mm. Um, I just thought they were backcrackers. Uh, and uh, anyway, he did da 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 and, uh, and now I feel amazing. Mm. Anyone else is in this situation, I can strongly recommend going to see Angus. Yes. Yeah. And my, my suggestion would be for those amongst our listeners here that can use testimonials and check with your local boards and stuff that you can, in the framework I often suggest, Mark, is similar to that too, to even interview the person and say, Mark, what was life like before you came in to see me here? What was really difficult for you to do? And how did that feel when you weren't able to do that? What were you worried about with regards to those things? And what took you time to come in and see me? And it identifies all of those kind of things along the way. Yep. And, and this can be done as an interview and just edit it back in there. And since you've been, you know, seeing Lisa down at Beryl Street, what are there too? What's life like now? And if you could communicate to somebody who was in the situation that you were beforehand, what would you say to them? And that in many cases often starts to stimulate a really great story there. I, I had a, a realisation for many years in terms, I thought people came to see me because they had a sore back. And it wasn't until I was 10 years in practice before I realised that pain isn't the real reason why somebody came to see me. I had a woman, um, Marie was her name. And I just, I, it kind of dawned on me that she'd had 10 years of back pain before coming to see me. And I kind of said to her, like, why now? Like, this has been going on for 10 years. Why are you coming to see me now? And she said, I know exactly why now. She said, the highlight of my day is when I get home from work and I walk with my husband. She said, I'm busy work. I've got young family and it's our time together. Sometimes it's only 20 minutes. Sometimes we sneak 45. We walk together and we debrief. And she said, over these last two weeks, my back pain has got to the stage I can't walk anymore. And in that moment, what I realised is that she wasn't after her back pain being removed. What she wanted was to be walking with her husband. And in every communication I had with her, it was all about, I need you to do these exercises because they'll keep you walking with your husband. I need you to be here twice a week because it'll keep you walking with her. And it's like it changed everything in 
my communication as a practitioner to start to dive in to find these stories underneath the difference between the logic that we talked about. Logically, she was there because it was a back, but that really wasn't the drive um, as, as well. It was a valuable lesson for me. And a fantastic story. Yes. Yeah. Yep. It, yep. it brings all of those things to great story. Well told. And, yes. and, and, and really it, that's, that's the, that's, that's the, that's all we do with this story stuff is go, you find examples that illustrate things and rather than assert views and opinions and concepts and, and convincing arguments, you just give people examples. Mm. Um, uh, so just from a marketing perspective, one of the things that, that, that I'm seeing right now is that, that people are going, oh, yes, we've got much more opportunity to market to people now because people are spending more time at home in front of their computers and da-da-da. And, yeah, that might be true, but it doesn't mean they're easy to market to because mm. they are being oh, – I, I am being deafened by the noise in my inbox. Mm. And, you know, like there's so many people who are marketing at me right now. And so for those of your listeners who are trying to communicate with their audiences right now, um, in my, my company, anecdote, we have, we, we're not adding to the noise. We've made a conscious decision. We're not going to, even though we need to, to market right now, we're not adding to noise of going, oh, you know, do this, buy that, you know, here's why you should. We're just going, folks, this morning, something happened that you might be interested in and just give a little example that might be useful to people and send that, right? Because stories have impact. Mm -hmm. And when we, when we made the decision to stop trying to go, Oh, we've, we've, you know, we've put our programs online and uh, you know, you've got a great, when we stopped doing that and started saying, you know what? I really just want to know how you are. Mm. You know, this morning I set up a golf net uh, up on the roof and, and so my son and I are now, yeah, we've got this mini driving range and it's really good. Um, so we're kind of getting through, but I'd really not know how you are. Mm. Ah, we're getting much more response to that. Yes. Because it's, it's firstly, it's not transmission. You're not transmitting a message. You're, you're asking a question, but you're also showing a little bit of your own character you know, like about by talking about, you know, how I set up a golf net and da, da, da. Mm. So again, it's event based. Um, so anyway, if you want to get your message to, to be listened to, then, then story is a great, this is a great time to be using story. Yeah, I, I totally agree. One, one last question, perhaps before we start to wind things up, Mark, thank you so much for today. If, do you have um, uh, strategies that will help people um, mine for stories. Uh, so, yep, yeah, absolutely. So, there's we, we, some habits. Yes. That we talk. So, so the first habit is to notice things and collect them. Yes. So, story. I, 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 I talk about stories as being like raindrops falling around us, and I see that it's raining outside yes. right now here in Melbourne. Yes. Um, so, yeah, you know, the raindrops fall, and if you don't have a container. They just evaporate or run down the drain, right? You, they're gone. They're ephemeral. So you need a container. We call it a story bank. So stories are like raindrops. You need to collect them. Have a little place. I, have a, I, have, I use Evernote. Right? Mm -hmm. I just When something happens of interest, and, and by the way, something happens of interest multiple times every day. Mm -hmm. I just make a couple of notes. Um, for example, uh, this morning, I, li I listened to your most recent episode of the podcast. Tim Ferriss, riding the bike, straight into my story bank. I just open it, new note, Tim Ferriss, Venice Beach, riding a bike, stop and smell the roses. Mm. That's all I did, right? It took me a few seconds. Anyway, that's habit number one is just notice things that have an impact on you. Mm. The little girl who walks out smiling, the patient who says, thank you, you've made a difference. Those are stories. And look, you might not even know how you're going to use them in the future, mm -hmm. but habit number one is to, is to just to notice things. Um, the, and the, the second thing is the, that you've, you've been very big on is the listening thing is to ask people about events. So um, what, why are you here? What, you know, why are you, well, you, you, for years you've been doing this? Oh, you know, because every day I walk my husband and now I'm not uh, right. So that is a story. Mm. And so, you, and, so ask questions that 
that take people to events. So you kind of collect stories by asking questions. Um, so you've got to extract the, the story from people. Mm. Um, Great. Was there a third so one? Those are, oh, those are the, oh, sorry. Um, when, so uh, notice things that happen and collect them, ask yep. questions. Yep. Um, but also just listen to what people, listen to what's going on around you. Mm. Yeah. Right. So, so you need to be, you know, like listening for things that are happening and, and, uh, and, and collecting stories that way as well. Yes. So it's really about having a repertoire so that when you are trying to communicate a message, you've got something in your, in your, in your, in your, in your repertoire that you can use. Yes. And am I right in saying to, and I think you've kind of mentioned this and I'd like to just kind of put a, a circle around this is that they don't have to be your stories is that if you hear somebody else as the story I told on the podcast of the bike ride, um, it wasn't my story. It was a story I heard somebody else. So I acknowledged where I heard the story from and then I told it. Um, I, I don't I, personally from a, a, a moral and ethical standpoint, I feel like that's all I need to do. I just need to reference where it came from. And I tell hundred percent, hundred percent. Any story that anyone tells you, you can use, you simply acknowledge the source. You never ever, claim it as your own you yes. go horribly wrong if yes. you start saying this is my story um yeah. you know, one of the one a, 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 well it's not a story so much as a metaphor uh that i use a, a lot um is from a guy called doug stevenson i saw him speak at a conference in uh, in in uh, in denver in 2017 i think it was anyway and uh, and so uh what he did is he he said uh, back in uh, 2001, my dog was sick and I really like my dog, right? So I take the dog to the vet and uh, the vet says, you need to give the dog these pills. And so I went home and I really love this dog, right? I want the dog to get better. So I took the pill out of the thing and I put the pill in the dog's mouth and what did the, what did the dog do? It spat it out. Spat it straight out. I know best. I know that the dog needs this, so I persist. So I pick the pill up and I put it back in its mouth, spits it out. I do this three or four times and it's like, and then I think, you know what? I'm smarter than a dog. Mm -hmm. So I put the, dog, the pill in the dog's mouth and I held the dog's mouth shut for the requisite amount of time until it had to have swallowed. And then I let go. Pill comes straight back out. <laughs> and he goes, so my wife then says to me, you know, there's a better way. She said, get the peanut butter, wrap the, you know, just put some peanut butter around the pill, throw it on the floor and see what happens. So I took the peanut butter, put the, you know, wrapped the pill in peanut butter, threw it on the floor. The dog comes over, eats it up, looks at me and says, can I have more? Mm. And he said, story is like the peanut butter for your data, for your message, for your argument. Wrap your pill in the peanut butter. And story is just a different container for getting your message across. So anyway, but I use that a lot. I simply say it's Doug Stevenson's. Yeah. Well, what a great way to wind things up there too, to finish that, that, uh, you know, story is the peanut butter around the pill there too. Mark, thank you so much for being so generous today. I'm going to commit to stop saying I've got a story or let me tell you a story. That's my major take home um, from, from many today. If our listeners want to follow up with you uh, a little more, find out more about you, where's the best place for them to go? Uh, uh, so anecdote.com is the uh, is our website. We've been blogging uh, since 2004. We have a podcast and the podcast is specifically designed to help people build their repertoire of stories. So each week we share a story that you can use and that's specifically there's a story that you can use. And by the way, the Tim Ferriss one may well feature. <laughs> um, and so uh, if so the podcast, uh, there's a story you can use. We talk about why that story works and how you can use it in a business context. So those are probably the best way. If you want to contact me directly, just send a, an email to mark at anecdote.com and oh, sorry, I'll say that again, people at anecdote.com and just say you know, message for Mark and yes. it'll, it'll get to me. Wonderful. I'll make sure I have all those details in the show notes um, as, as well. Mark, thanks for sharing uh, with us today. I, I'm fascinated by the whole concept of story. I'm looking forward to diving into your podcast 
and learning uh, a little bit more from there as well. So thanks again. I hope to see you soon. Angus, it's been a pleasure and, uh, and best wishes and stay safe in this uh, strangest of times. <laughs> Wacky times. Take care, mate. Have a great day. Thanks, mate. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, you have to come and check out the Community Influencer Program. It's my monthly coaching program where we take all this material and I'll work one-on-one with you to apply, implement, systematize and help guide you and your practice to the next level. Now you can join me on over at adiomedia.com forward slash join. That's adiomedia.com forward slash join. I'd love to see you in there.